Those who knew her say Mrs. Marguerite Reimer Sears had one overriding passion in life. Well, two, if you read what her husband had to say. The first was sharing the teachings of the Baha'i faith with others. The second, her husband will tell you about later. But I'll give you a clue. It has to do with some four-legged creatures. Her love for the Baha'i faith took root when she was in her early 20s, and her major life decisions would stem from that love. Marguerite was born to Viola and Charles Reimer in Wisconsin in 1912. Becoming a Baha'i would make a world of difference to this daughter of the Midwest. Everything from her understanding of gender roles to her cultural identity would be shaped by these new teachings. Most important thing were the world principles, that everything was on a very, very broad, broad basis. Uh, I had uh, no feelings of prejudice about race or anything like that, and I was very grateful to see that this was part of the Baha'i faith. The of mankind affected me very deeply. Once Marguerite made her decision to be a Baha'i, sharing the principles with others took precedence. Even over dating and the hunt for a husband. In fact, she was on a teaching trip for the Baha'i faith when she met the man who would one day be her husband. But it turned out that the meetings were planned for only in the evenings. And so I had my days free. So I, I went to the newspaper and I went to the radio station. And when, at the radio station, I got acquainted with the girl who was in the reception area. And I said, you know, does anybody want to do a talk, hear a talk about the Baha'i faith? And uh, so then I used to go and have lunch with her. We used to go out to lunch every day. And <clears throat> one day she said, you know, we've got a lot of nice young men here. We ought to meet some of them. And that's how I met Bill. <laughs> Among the uh, like young men, I chose him. <laughs> William Sears was a radio broadcaster with a flair for drama. Bill was smitten from the day he met Marguerite. And here's where we discover Marguerite's second overriding passion in life. The afternoon I asked Marguerite for our first date, she was on a teaching trip for the Baha'i Faith. Footnote, see God Loves Lasser, ask anybody. What I didn't notice was that Marguerite had a Siamese kitten with her in the front seat of her car, a vervet monkey named Jimmy on a leash hooked to the window lock in the back seat, and there were two Borzoes lying on the roof awaiting her return to where she had parked the car. I naturally assumed that she was babysitting all of these animals for some zoo or a passing carnival or some of her odd friends, and she did have some odd ones. <laughs> they were Baha'is. The more I knew them, the better I liked them. They were different. I came to learn that they were among the finest people on the planet. Of course, not all of them carried a personal zoo in the car with them. I realize now that I should have asked Marguerite about the animals right away. But Marguerite's robin's egg blue eyes and her film test teeth foiled me. She knocked me for six, as the British say. Bill proposed before agreeing to explore Marguerite's religion. Marguerite would accept on a couple of conditions. Well, you see, I was 25-ish when I met Bill. I wasn't a youth any longer. And uh, I had pretty definite ideas about what I wanted to do with my life. And I said, to, the Baha'i faith is number one in my life, and everything that I do has to reflect from that. And I said there would be times when I would be in a community where I would have to go to meetings or something of that sort, which might not be convenient for you. And I told him all of these things in advance, and <clears throat> he agreed, so otherwise uh, we wouldn't have got married. Bill appreciated Marguerite's focus in life and agreed to her conditions. However, he was known to affectionately poke fun at their partnership. Bill later wrote, 
Marguerite was far ahead of her time. She broke early ground for women's rights. I'm talking about way back in those days when ERA meant earned run average. Those hazy, happy days when women knew their place and nothing about baseball. Marguerite was most interested in being a pioneer for the Baha'i faith, someone who moves from their native home to share the Baha'i faith with others. This interest played a major role in the family's decision of where to live. By the time we got married, he was working in Iowa, and uh, he, <laughs> he always said I married him 50% because I loved him and 50% because he was in a pioneer area because there were no Baha'is in the area in <laughs> Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> which wasn't too far from wrong, but um, he hadn't told me that he had already applied for a job in California, and California had the largest number of Baha'is in the States. So I was, I was devastated. I was just sick that, that, uh, to think I was going to be leaving a pioneer state and going to California, of all places. On the way there, we liked Utah, and so he applied for a job in Utah, which was the same as Iowa, as far as I was concerned, because there were no Baha'is in Utah either. And uh, we stayed there for some time. Bill had long held a desire to find God. By the time he met Marguerite, it had faded into a childhood dream. It was shortly after moving to Utah that Marguerite set about reawakening that dream. The task took time and care. Well, he was an actor, he was a playwright, and uh, he was interested in, in dramatic things, and there's hardly anything more dramatic than the Dawnbreakers. And I thought this would affect him more than anything else. The Dawnbreakers retells the harrowing history of the first men and women to commit to the Baha'i cause, known as Babis. The Babi faith was short-lived as many of the followers became Baha'is. However, the heroism of the Babis in the face of violent persecution finally piqued Bill's interest. For three weeks he read that every day. He read it three times from cover to cover. And then at the end of the time, he wanted to become a Bobby. <laughs> I wrote to Horace Holly and I asked him, what do I do now? <laughs> and he wrote back and he said, don't persecute him. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> it only lasted a couple of weeks. <laughs> and he became a Baha'i. <laughs> Helping the Baha'i community to grow became a hallmark of Bill and Marguerite's life together. The task would soon take the family out of the life they knew in the United States. In 1953, Marguerite attended the Baha'i World's first intercontinental teaching conference held in Kampala, Uganda. I really liked Africa and enjoyed it very much and, and uh, <clears throat> when I got home I told Bill about it and of course he was at the top of his profession at that point and uh, he asked to leave and they said if you leave 56 people will lose their jobs. Uh, incidentally one of them was Ed McMahon. <laughs> anyway we decided to have 19 days of prayer about this. And about the 16th day, his boss called him into the office and said, you can go if you want to. The company, the sponsor that you have has had a strike and they've canceled their program. So that was the answer and we left. I gave up my bachelor's button, Miller's High Life Bear, Muscatel, Slow Gin Fizzes and the Catholic Church for a newly acquired passport and two tickets to Africa. Knowing all the animals Marguerite was taking along, we'd have to leave in Noah's Ark, but it wasn't too bad. <laughs>
The Sears family settled outside of Johannesburg, South Africa. Their work as pioneers was guided by the directives of Shoghi Effendi, the head of the Baha'i faith at that time. It was the greatest challenge because it was during the apartheid system and the Guardian was giving us step-by-step -step exact method of approach. We weren't even to make friends with white people unless it uh, was in relationship to holding our jobs that we had. We had to be extremely careful in everything we did, but it made it a great challenge and it was a very exciting and a very wonderful, wonderful time. Just great. After a couple of years in South Africa, Bill and Marguerite's life of service would change again, this time in a startling way. We went to the post office box to, for mail one day, and the box was full of cables. And uh, I was, he was driving, and he asked me to read a cable. And I read a cable that it said uh, something like, um, a congratulations on being lifted to this new stage. And the second one was very much a similar type of thing, and so was the third. He said, they think I've died. <laughs> then we got to the one from, <laughs> that was the real one. <laughs> the final cable read was from Shoghi Effendi. It said that Bill had been appointed a hand of the cause of God. The hands of the cause assisted Shoghi Effendi in promoting and protecting the Baha'i faith around the globe. Only a handful of men and women were ever named hands of the cause of God. It was a rare honor. And he stopped the car in the middle of Main Street of Johannesburg and he said, you drive. <laughs> he went around and sat on the other side and I drove home. Of course we knew our lives would never be the same again, and they weren't. But uh, it was such a shock. Bill and Marguerite would now live a life of constant travel. I know you've traveled all over the world and are, frankly, I guess the grandfather and the grandmother of all the Baha'i children all over right, the world. Right. All the English-speaking world, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and French. And French. <laughs> Even though advanced in years and in ailing health, the couple kept a demanding itinerary. Bill passed away in 1992. Marguerite was not yet ready to rest. When Bill passed on, the, the Universal House of Justice very kindly wrote and asked what my plans were. And I told them that my first plan was to go back to Africa. And the second one was to work with David Haddon building a school. And then I had three others that were not very interesting or very important. And when they answered, they said they felt my best option was to work with David building the school. So that's why I'm here. 
Marguerite would spend the final years of her life in the desert outside of Tucson, Arizona. With her encouragement, the Desert Rose Baha'i Institute would be born. It is hoped that the school will one day be a fine arts university. Well, I think for us, she was larger than life. Because all the wonderful things that I've ever done really have been because of her. I was able to go to the opening of the gardens with her in Haifa. And when I was there, you know, we'd be walking through the streets and, and there'd be Baha'is from all over the world coming to her and saying, oh, you taught me the faith, you know, my whole family are Baha'is, and just from all over, all over the world, they were just scattered, you know, from all different races, and it, it was just so exciting to see all these people that, that loved her and thought of her as their spiritual mother. And the impact that she's had, can you imagine, I mean, she taught one person and they taught their family, and then who knows what spread from there. Every she did was about the high faith. Every choice that she made on a daily basis was whether or not is this going to help uh, the faith of Baha'u'llah? Is this going to teach someone? Is this going to influence the the world in a in a spiritual way? Probably the first and most important thing that every person on the face of the earth has to learn is it's the purpose of life. And when we recognize the fact that. It is to know, to love, and to serve God. Looking at life is entirely different. It, the material side isn't the most important, and any other part of it is not the most important, but that factor is the thing that is going to bring together the world. <laughs>